Welcome to the Open Forum in the Villages Florida podcast. In this show we talk to leaders in the community, leaders of clubs and interesting folks who live here in the villages, to give perspectives of what is happening here in the Villages Florida. We are a listener-supported podcast. How can you support our podcast? This is Mike Roth, and listeners, I'm thrilled to share with you this podcast, which is my passion project for you. This podcast brings me joy, brings you knowledge, inspiration, and a lot of things that people need to know about the villages and the people that are living here and what's actually going on. Creating this podcast is a labor of love, even though it demands more time than I can easily spare. But hey, Time isn't something we can buy back, right? Now, here's where you come in, the unsung heroes and heroines. You can help us keep the podcast alive and thriving. How? By becoming a supporter. There are two simple ways that you can support us. The first is a small monthly donation. Visit our podcast website, openforuminthevillagesflorida.com and click on the black supporter box. Even a small three to $10 a month donation makes a difference. And guess what? You can cancel any time, no strings attached. The second way that you can contribute to the podcast is by making a purchase of an Amazon product at Amazon standard prices, and we are paid a small commission on each purchase as an Amazon affiliate. That way there's no extra money out of your pocket, but you are supporting the podcast. Check every week because we're going to be adding new Amazon products that you can buy and support the podcast with. Thank you. And your support means the world to us. Stay curious, stay inspired, and keep those headphones on. This is Mike Roth on Open Forum in the Villages, Florida. I'm welcoming back Peter Bernard. Thanks for being with us, Peter. Good to be here again. Good. In today's show, Peter... I think we're going to talk about some common maintenance issues that people have here in the villages. The first thing we were talking about before we started this episode was garage door insulation. We have, everybody's got metal garage doors here. And it transmits that heat like you can't believe. It's 100% transmission. Mm -hmm. And it's going into a garage, which is uninsulated in most cases, and if you have a window to the outside, it's a small window, and you can't cir- circulate a lot of air. No. The other solution people have used is they open up their attic access and send the hot air up into the attic. Works a little bit. A little bit. Now, I think we both have insulated our garage doors, and why don't you tell our listeners what you did for insulation? Well, the first thing I did when I moved here, because I noticed it was so hot out there, I paid a couple of dudes to come out and do it, because I didn't think I was going to be able to. Mm -hmm. And they did the easy route, where they had this stuff that's foldable, bendable, and they stuck it in. It took them about seven minutes to do my entire garage for 200 bucks, and I thought, hmm, I think maybe I can do better. I left that stuff in, and I went out and got the styrofoam boards. Many of the garages here in the villages have a hurricane bar that goes across. It's an that's, extra truss. That's, that, that's code. That's code. But getting that thing off, there are a lot of little screws. And a lot of you bolts. Don't, if you don't get it lined up just right, putting it back on, now you're in a heap of trouble. So I decided to go the cheap route, and I didn't take it off, and I was cutting the styrofoam to put in there. Ended up cutting my hand at one point. I got a little bit of blood on the styrofoam. We did it, and it was a pain, and I'd never do it again not without taking out those those special trusses. So the next thing I did is I went to Home Depot and I bought the stuff that looks like aluminum foil. It's like a bubble wrap stuff, two-sided foil on both sides. And it was easy to install. I put that in and I used some, some of that tape that looks like aluminum to help it stay in place. Mm-hmm. So now I've got some foam, I've got that stuff that they put in and I've got this aluminum stuff. But here's the deal. After all that labor, I have yet to see if it's going to reduce the temperature in my garage because I haven't had a a new summer. This will be my second summer here. Okay, so do you have a recording thermometer in your garage? I do not. I used to. My wife thinks I broke it because of the heat in the garage. I don't think that was the reason, but no. But it's a simple deal. I'll I'll go check it. Some people want to know the before and after. We have a Wi-Fi garage thermos Mm. thermometer, which measures temperature and humidity. And it's recorded in Home Assistant so that I can take a look at the graph to see how well it does. Mm -hmm. It hasn't done very well. I I have the single layer of flexible that I put in where it's aluminumized on the side that faces the metal. Mm -hmm. 
and it's a white plastic on the inside. The failure was, one of the failures, is that it, it doesn't cover the overlap between the doors where the doors bend. Mm-hmm. Okay, did you cover that? No, and I have done some tests with my hand, and I can feel it coming in, the, the heat, the radiant heat the, is coming the, through. Those are little radiators, the edges. Exactly. And I had win- I have windows in my garage, so I took a couple hours one day, and I put tinting up there to keep the uh, sun's rays from coming through. Now, that's going to provide a minimal amount of protection, but I can tell by putting my hand up there, too, that it's helping a little. Yeah. I was over at Matt Mormon's place, the uh, obsessed garage, and he has the flexible foam insulation over the metal uh, between the doors, where the, where the doors fold, so that he has almost 100% seal on the garage door for the heat barrier. Good. And it was the inside of his warehouse with the doors is cool, and I touched the interior where he had the fold, and it was in the 70s when That's it was in the good. 90s outside. Mike, I looked into, and I had a guy give me a, a quote on, I was going to have some solar-powered Ants. attic fans put yeah. in, and I also inquired about having a fan put in my garage. You can have a thermostatically controlled fan that will kick on at a certain temperature. Mm-hmm. Now, what it does is it takes the hot air from your garage and vents it to your attic, and then hopefully your soffits are going to vent that and all that kind of stuff. And they I will. Did. It will, but... I don't know if there's a return on investment there because now I have to pay electric bills to run that fan. And, of course, the solar is going to hopefully vent that out. If you did both of them, I think you might get a benefit. I haven't figured that it's a benefit because if you're venting the air out of the garage, there's got to be new air that's coming in. And it's hot. It's 95 degrees outside. You get 95 degrees air in and you push in. 95 degree or 100 degree air out the top, it's not much of a efficiency thing. Uh, now, if you have a air conditioned garage, you've, you've turned your garage into a woodwork, woodworking shop or a, a place where you work on your cars. A mini split. Yeah, the mini split. Then the air conditioned garage door would make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Okay, and double insulating it would be a, a perfect solution because then you've, you're dealing with colder air. Right. And this is going to affect people in the villages that have west or east-facing garages. For the morning, it's going to be the uh, east-facing garage. In the afternoon, it's going to be the west-facing garages. And in mine, get, I have a west exposure in the afternoon, and it just heats up like no one's business. And I have two Teslas parked in there. And I had a thermal uh, indicator last year. My little red T on my charger starts going off, and that means that it's overheating, and that means no more charging is happening. No, that means you have to air condition your garage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a point of no return, and a. I looked at the whole putting in the thermal, uh, the solar powered vents up there, and I asked the guy at the company. I said, "Is there going to be a savings on my utility bill after I did this?" And he hemmed and hawed a bit, and he goes, "Not really." And I said, "Then what's my return on investment? Why would I do it?" And he goes, well, "You got to get that heat out, and then the humidity, and." which is probably true. It's probably better for the roof not to have 140 degrees or higher in your attic. If you have good insulation above your head, hopefully that won't radiate down. But I didn't get the return on investment. At least it didn't work out on paper. And and the, the roofs in this area of the, of the villages, I'm not sure about the new areas, maybe you could tell me, have the radiant barrier, which is a piece of aluminum foil. The heat that comes down hits the aluminum. It's supposed to be going back out yeah. through the asbestos tiles. Yeah. It's not standard equipment. I know some people that have done that, and yeah. whether or not it's working for them, I don't know. But it, was, it was standard equipment in this part of the village. It makes sense. I think it makes perfect sense. It didn't make any difference in the heat. No. Okay. In fact, what it does is it stops cellular signals. I know. Yeah. So then you, get a, you have to get a booster of some kind. If you look on the, the desk there, that, that little box with the blue light, that's the booster. It, yep. It's connected to a wire that goes outside, so we have GPS signal on yeah. cell phones inside that. It took a while for us to figure that out, why yep. the cell phones work when we stepped out the front door or the back door, but not in the house. <laughs> you solve one problem, and then it makes a problem else, elsewhere. I'm not sure that the, the radiant barrier solved the problem, mm-hmm. but it sounds good. I'm glad I didn't do it. I had a guy offer to do my house for $3,000. My wife and I talked about it, and we didn't do it, so maybe it's better. Your cell phone signal in the house good? I, my cell phone signal is great. I'll but say, I look outside, I know there's a T-Mobile tower right there. I can see it. Okay. Then you made the right decision. I think so. I think yeah. so. Since we were talking about garage doors, 
Let's talk a little bit about the garage door maintenance. Many people have the chain drive garage doors here in the villages, which are standard. Mm -hmm. What kind of annual maintenance should someone do or have done to their garage doors? I'm a nut about this kind of stuff, as you probably have guessed. Yes. I buy this stuff. It's I believe it's lithium white grease. It comes in a uh, aerosol can. And I go to every single place where there's movement. And that means the rollers. It means the hinges. It means the chain, the motor drive. And I just give it a, you don't have to overdo it. Just a little, t like not even that long, just as enough. And you have to make sure that you aim it right because it's messy and it's smelly. Messy, yes. And don't do it when your car's in the garage. You don't want that on your paint. I did it once and I spent <laughs> hours getting it off. So put the cars out in the driveway and then all the way around. And then run it a couple of times, up and down and up and down to get it all the way around. I think it's a great maintenance. I think it'll save you in the long run. And that can runs you. You get it on Amazon for, I don't know, 8 to $12. It's nothing. Yeah, they're, they're available at the local auto parts stores. There you go. And Lowe's and Home mm -hmm. Depot. That's one way to do it. I, I, I use the lithium grease in a tube, okay? And I s remove the old grease, slather that new stuff on, and for a while, it really quiets the garage door down. You wear a glove? I Yes, I wear a glove, and I use paper towels mm -hmm. to, to remove the old. Perfect. I, I have my wife st stand there with a trash can mm -hmm. to collect the greasy <laughs> paper towels. Right. It reminds me, of, uh, on my bicycles, I use a lubrication on the chain, and I try to get it all off because it's black from riding, right. and then put the new stuff on, and then use the paper towel to get it moved all around, and on the gears on the back, too. Yeah, uh, I can't speak for bicycles anymore. Uh, on the garage door, it tends to work real well. The other thing that I do is I tighten every bolt, okay? Mm -hmm. Every bolt on the door, and I find that at least 10% of the bolts are stripped out. Stripped out? Yes. Mm -hmm. When you turn them, there's no tension on right. it anymore right. because they're self-tapping bolts. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've looked for, forever for a new, larger self-tapping bolt that can go into the same hole. Couldn't find one at Lowe's or Home Depot or even checked Spar. Yeah. And then I decided what I'm going to do is put a screw and bolt in, okay, and put a nut behind there. It's not hard to do, and tighten it down. That seemed to stop a lot of the squeaking. Wow, that sounds like a great tip. I, I know from going up, and the, the vibration of the thing, just going up and down and up and down, has to loosen that stuff. It, it's putting fatigue on that metal. So tightening them up, I think it's a great idea. I think something else most people don't bother to tighten is the actual mounting bolts that hold the motor up to the ceiling. Oh, I didn't think of that. Okay. And then the mount, there are about four or five mounting bolts that hold the tracks to the door frame. Mm -hmm. All of that was loose. Oh my goodness. You know, easily a little bit, a quarter turn more on 12 bolts. I can do that. I'm learning something and here. I want to throw out something too. If you look at your chain and there's an excessive amount of sagging, it's an easy procedure just to loosen that bolt a little bit, tighten, tighten, and then tighten it back up again. I'm not a garage door expert, but I know that it should not be sagging a lot. If the garage door chain touches the track... Then it's sagging. It's sagging. Yeah. Okay. It can sag a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. You don't want it over tight. And the other thing that I recently solved was the... When I opened the garage door chain with tension very tight, and then all of a sudden the garage door would pop up. And that was because the garage door was sticking. Uh, uh. So at first I went after the rubber seal at the bottom of the garage door. That wasn't sticky. And I, I researched it on the internet. And some guy said, it's where your garage door touches the insulation at the front. Mm -hmm. And so I touched the backside of the vinyl insulation with my fingers. And my God, that stuff was sticky. Mm -hmm. Did you and clean it? I cleaned it with an acetone solution. Mm -hmm. And that work? It worked. <laughs> All right. And, and and then six weeks later, it was sticky again. And the second solution was, after you clean it, lubricate the vinyl channel with Vaseline. And since I've done that, bingo, both doors don't stick. I'll give you one more tip for the listeners today. Um, you do have that black seal on the bottom of your garage. What I'll do is open my garage to about eye level because I don't want to have to be reaching over my head. And I take a uh, rubber protectant that I use on my car, put it on, saturate a paper towel or a rag, and go along that just over and over again. It's rubber. It's going to deteriorate. It's in the part of it is in the sun in the afternoon. And I think I'm going to get more life out of that. The garage door or the the golf car as well. Yeah, it gets crushed. It gets crushed down. 
the the thing that I don't think people should do is adjust the spring tension. No, not yourself. No. I heard a story recently. My neighbor said he tried to adjust the spring, and he's lucky he's still with us because his screwdriver came popping out and right by his head. It would have killed him. That is dangerous work. I leave that to the professionals. Yeah, you got to have the special tools oh, yeah. and, and the locking pins. I'm afraid of my garage door spring. I know the times in my life when it's gone out, it sounds like a gunshot in the garage. It does. It really does. Mm-hmm. They're under a lot of tension. But when I lube the garage door, I spray uh, silicone spray into the spring. That's good. To uh, remove any tension. Right. And we all have these cables too. And I lubricate the, the spool, rollers. The spool, yeah, at the top. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Any place there's a ball bearing. That's it. The weather is tough on it. That's right. Yeah. I think the listeners of the Mike Ross show are going to be out there tomorrow doing all this stuff. Good. Let's take a short break and listen to Dr. Craig Curtis give us an Alzheimer's tip. This is Mike Roth and Dr. Craig Curtis. We're talking about Alzheimer's disease. Let's talk about the uh, omega-3 and omega-6. How should people get that from their diet? Well, primarily, you should get that through beans and nuts and legumes and fish. Mm -hmm. You can take a supplement of omega-3, omega-6s. However, don't overdo the supplementation of omega-3 specifically. There was a large study published by the American College of Cardiology a few years back that seemed to show that people that took too much omega-3 might have an increased risk of a heart arrhythmia. So my recommendation is if you buy omega-3 supplements, take it as written. With over 20 years of experience studying brain health, Dr. Curtis's goal is to educate the village's community on how to live a longer, healthier life. To learn more, Visit his website, craigcurtismd.com or call 352-500-5252 to attend a free seminar. I'm back with Peter Bernard. Peter, let's talk about water heaters. And half of the villages, we have the old-fashioned Tank. water heater. Yeah. In many cases, electric, could be gas. Those have two different maintenance issues that homeowners should address. Okay. At least once every five years, change the anode rod. Yeah. Is that something a homeowner can do? I'm not real familiar. I've done it myself. It's really? very easy. Yeah. Okay. Even if you have a very tight, low ceiling, mm-hmm. okay, you use a, I think it was a 27 millimeter wrench mm-hmm. with a six foot handle and you just give it a little, turn off all the water pressure, okay, and the power mm-hmm. and turn off the gas, the water going into the water heater. That's so you have, smart. You, yeah. <laughs> and then you want to put a hose on the drain and drain the a few gallons out into the street. Okay, you want to lower the water level. After you've lowered the water level, then you take take the wrench and hold the tank with one hand so it doesn't move and yeah. slowly undo the screw, which is the anode rod. The anode rod that I took out was supposedly solid aluminum. After five years, it was solid wire. There was wow. no aluminum Dang. left on it. Was there any calcium carbonate on it? Oh, lots of it. Yeah. Lots of it. So what I bought from Amazon, I have it on my supporter site. If you go to the support button, there are products from Amazon that I recommend. Yep. And this one w- was a, a steel cable with aluminum and cadmium on it, but in, in 12-inch sections. So you could put it into your tank. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it was longer than the rod that I took out. So all I did is cut the wires on the last section. So it, it became at the same length. Wow. Okay. okay. And slip it in one section at a time, tighten it back up. Turn on the water again, and mm-hmm. away you go. Do you know this for a fact? I used to have that kind of a water heater, and I used to hear a crackling and a popping when it was running on the electric version. Mm-hmm. And somebody told me once, and I don't know if this is true, that's a sign that calcium carbonate has built up on that anode, and maybe it needs to be changed out. Yeah, so? well, you, definitely. I, I would say that an anode rod rarely lasts more than three years. Especially if you have hard water. If you have hard water, I would do it every year. Mm-hmm. We have water a water softener in here, which also went out. Yeah. Well, oh, God. <laughs> and, All right. So let's jump to uh, the but, tankless. Are you, one more thing yeah. on, on the water, hot water heaters. Above the hot water heater, there's usually an expansion tank. Okay. If the expansion tank fails, it will cause your hot water heater to fail. Yikes. So you, you, it's got a bladder in there, a rubber bladder about mm-hmm. midway through, and half of it's supposed to be filled with air and half of it's supposed to be filled with water. Mm -hmm. So if you tap it with a long screwdriver, you'll hear a different sound from the bottom to the top, and you'll know what the water level is inside your tank. If it's the same sound from bottom to top, it's time to change that 
expansion tank, which mm-hmm. isn't hard to do. Okay, you can get them on Amazon. You can get them at Lowe's. You don't have to do any. Uh, you don't have to sweat the pipe on. No, screw, it's a screw-in thread. Okay. Use your Teflon tape, and yep. away you go. There you go. Save the tank uh, by putting in a thirty-dollar expansion tank. Good tip. Good hey, tip. It's much better than spending a thousand dollars to have a plumber change out your hot water heater for sure. For too sure. early. Now, tell us a little bit about the hot water heaters right. in the new section. In the new section, and they're doing it everywhere, Dabney, Citrus Grove, and I'm sure down in Middleton and all Eastport, they have mm, tankless gas hot water or water heater. I hate to say hot water heater. If it was hot already, you wouldn't want to heat it. But anyway, there's a heat exchanger in there, and it has a tendency to build up calcium carbonate and other kinds of minerals on there. The fix is easy. They have special bypass valves on these things. And you can you turn off the thing first inside. You go in the garage, just hit it, and it'll, the, the display goes out. Now you know you're not providing any power to it. No need to turn off the gas. It's not going to do anything. So uh, once that's done, turn off the valve to for the cold coming in. Turn off the valve for the hot going back into your house. And then you open the valves for the two uh, bypasses. And I hook up a, a, a mer- submersible pump, and I have a bucket filled with two gallons of vinegar and I just let that run for about 45 minutes. I've done probably 15 or 14. I donated some of that labor for our AED program in Citrus Grove. And then there's some neighbors that heard I was doing it. I ended up having to put the kibosh on the whole thing because it was getting to be ridiculous. Hey, would you do mine? Would you, you did my neighbor, would you? Look, I love my neighbors, but I'm not in the hot, the water heater decal decalcification business so i stopped i said look go find someone else local hand they may do that so it's something i think you should do every year if you have hard water coming in i have a soft water machine like you do so i think i can extend that period out Mm -hmm. but you just let it run for 45 minutes another tip though i did the whole vinegar routine it's white vinegar let it run blah 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 i went online and i found that there's this stuff that they make for coffee makers and it's a chemical decalcification product it comes in a little packet about five inches by five inches and i made a little slurry of that stuff and put it in my bucket and i ran it after i did the vinegar thing i got a lot more out so i think i'm going to stick with that in the future what's it called you got me it is if you go online and say coffee maker cleaner and it comes in a little white packet it looks very industrial so it's not something that i think they intended for water heaters but it, it sure does the job that's a good thing to know yeah it was brown i was when I, after I had done the vinegar, I used that, and it mm-hmm. came. The water came out brown, still with the recirculating pump and the whole shebang. I'm glad I did it. Mm-hmm. And in your home, you still have the water softener. Oh yes. Okay, and you've tested the effectiveness of the water softener. Yeah, I have a dip the dip, dips, this, dip, the yeah. test strips. Right. Interesting. I had this system when I was in Pinellas County. I moved up here last May. It's a very expensive system. It's made by Connecticut. There's no electricity to it, blah, blah, blah. It uses a cog that measures how many gallons you use and just does a regen. I love it. So at my house now, it comes through the Nova system. Now you've seen those blue t- things that people yeah. have, the filters, right? Now, that's not a softener. That's not a softener. And so it takes out some of the particulate and things like that. Then I have it going through a dechlorinator. So it takes out, I'd say, 90% of the chlorine. Activated and, charcoal. Yes, it's what it is, which has to be refurbished every now and then. And then it goes through two baths of beads, and those beads are charged so that they attract the calcium off of it in other the minerals. resin beads, yeah. right? But the, as it, with all softeners, it has to be clean, and it has to. What happens is there's a salt mixture, brine that goes through, and that takes the so, uh, the calcium that's collected on the beads out and flushes it out. I love the system; it's doing a great job. Now, are you providing the salt water brine tank? Yes, there's a tank that has the salt, and I have to replenish that every now and then. Yeah. Okay. But I'd say I, I'm very cognizant of the fact that we live in a humid environment here, so if I have too much of it in there, it'll start making what's called a bridge. You don't want a salt bridge, so I put about a foot and a half of salt, and I check it about every week, and then it does the job. Yeah. That I was talking to a plumber, and he said that's the number one problem with the water salt, is salt, salt bridge. bridges. Yeah. And then it, it's like it's not even there anymore. It, it, you're not doing the job. That's right. The test strips will tell you whether or not your water softener is turning out yeah. soft water. I, I My test strips have a little color code that you look on to see how soft it is. And when I dip it and do the 30-second wait, it doesn't even change color at all, which means I'm, I got the nice soft water. But the so- benefits of soft water, I think some people say, oh, yeah, I'm fine the way it is. The benefits of soft water is when you wash your hair, you're going to get better suds. When you wash your dishes, you're going to use less detergent. 
when you do uh, laundry, you use less detergent. I think just all in all, it's a benefit. Yes, they be ex- they're expensive. There's companies here in town. Nova does it. Pegasus does it. There's a Connecticut. It's called E-Water. There's a whole bunch of K-Water. It's called. There's a whole bunch of companies that do this, but I think it's worth the investment, especially if you're going to be in your house for a while. We did it when we moved in, and we spent about two grand. We did soft water, and we put reverse osmosis underneath the kitchen sink. Nice. For the kitchen sink. For drinking water. And drinking cooking. water and the refrigerator. Ah. Okay. Or ice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's worked out very well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I think buying bottled water in the store is archaic, especially like the big five-gallon jugs that people haul around. Or I can't imagine doing that. Just as a hurricane of source of, cold, of right. water, drinking water, we keep a you know ten or twelve bottles or more. Yeah, in our hurricane closet. I'm a meteorologist, so I'll tell you that as far as hurricanes goes. Obviously, we're not going to have the flooding that we've seen along the coast. We're far enough away from that. The big threat here is wind and knocking over power lines and causing the power to go out and maybe taking off a few shingles. I think generally speaking, now I'll be proved wrong this hurricane season, generally speaking, we're fairly safe from the effects of hurricane. So we're talking about weather. Yeah. Are you still following the weather forecast for this year? I, I have a little bit. Some of the prognosticators are saying we're going to have a very active season. I tend to look at that with a jaundiced eye because they say that every year. Yeah, I think that keeps them employed. You're right. <laughs> Bad forecast. But they look at the, the wind currents, the gyras out in the sea, La Nina and El Nino, and I think this year they say we're not going to have the steering currents that would normally take those storms away from Florida. At least that's what they're saying now. I hope they're wrong. I hope we don't get any storms here in Florida. I hope they're wrong, too. There's some people who look at sea surface temperatures, and even the sand coming off the Sahara Desert affects what happens here. It's, it seems like when there's this, a lot of sand in the air from the Sahara Desert, that's good. We get a, a much softer, easier That's exactly season. true, because it doesn't heat up the surface of the seas as much and tends to make it so that we don't get the real strong storms. That's all good. Yeah, I like it. It's a fascinating thing. There's people from the University of Colorado that do a lot of this. Uh, color, believe it or not, Colorado talking about hurricanes. They've never seen one themselves, but right. they do a lot of this research. There's some, uh, I can't think of their names offhand, but there's some scientists out there. That's pretty much their full time job is to figure out. Check. what's going It's amazing. What about what do you think about the tornado season this year? Is it going to happen? <laughs> tornadoes happen in every state. Gets tornadoes. Mm-hmm. There is a area of the United States in the center that we refer to as Tornado Alley, mm-hmm. and it's Oklahoma and Kansas and Missouri and Iowa, and, and it's only because of the I call it the clash of the titans. Cold air comes in from the north, warm air from the south, which is very humid, and when they get together, it forces an upward travel of that ha- air, and then a tornado actually occurs first of all in a horizontal pa- fashion. And, right. and, and the yeah, and then it tends to bend, and then you that you see it. Now, if a tornado doesn't hit the ground, it's not a tornado. <laughs> and if it's over water, it's a, sea, a water spout. Water spout. Yeah. yeah. But so those water spouts can get pretty uh, feisty. I've seen them come ashore and rip up awnings and things. Yeah. Here in the southern areas of the villages, where you don't have a lot of big trees, it's not going to be as much of a problem as it up in the Marion County area where they have a lot of big trees. True, yeah. The mature plants up there, the mature trees, yeah, they'll tend to take it more. Pluses and minuses, I I love those mature trees. You drive around places in the orange blossom groves, it's just gorgeous up there. Mm-hmm. And you go down to where I live and they're twigs. Yeah, but they also don't clog your gutter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they will. That's a whole other story. There's this place out there called Leaf Filter that promised that the, if you put those on your gutters, it's going to help you. My personal opinion, it's bunk. I had them on my gutters in Cincinnati. Did it we work had, for you? That's a partial yes. Okay. okay. It's got a filter on the top that's supported by a plastic frame underneath the filter that's mounted on top of the gutter. Yes. And it sounds real good. It filters all of the large particles. But not pine needles and not the big stuff. The big stuff just tends to lay down on top of it. Which you, The whole promise of this thing is you don't have to clean your gutters anymore. You don't have to clean your gutters. You have to clean what's on top of the gutters. And you, in Cincinnati, we hope for a big windstorm to, to blow all those leaves off of the uh, the gutters. My, real quick digressing, I had leaf filter come out to my house, and they offered to do my until this is down in Pinellas County. Offered to do my whole house for six thousand. I balked. It came down to four thousand. I balked. It came down to thirty five hundred. I balked. Then when they left, they called me back and they said. If we just give it to you at cost, would you do it? <laughs> so don't take their first offer. If you are intent to get this stuff, which I don't think you should, don't take the first offer. Especially down here in the villages, unless you have trees directly over your gutters, mm-hmm. it's not going to be a problem. 
and in Cincinnati we had hundred mm-hmm. year old oak trees, right, and pine trees, uh, maple trees, mm-hmm. over the gutters, over the house. It was beautifully shady. Yeah. Okay. And shade is an important thing, but. Yeah, I just don't want to see folks uh, in their elderly years getting up on ladders and cleaning gutters. I think it's a, an unsafe practice. Peter, thanks for coming on and talking about those things. Sure thing. Yeah. Can I make a pitch real quick, Mike? Sure. I do a uh, segment. If you've ever heard of the newcomers Jerry and Linda, they are popular on YouTube. I do a every other week segment for them called Bubble Wrap. And some of the topics that we've covered here today have been subjects of my bubble wrap. Now, I am no expert on this stuff. I just learn, like when I used to have a gas car and things would go wrong with it, I learned how to fix those things by necessity because I was poor and I needed to do it myself. Now, these bubble wrap things are things I'm in a fairly new house in the villages and I'm needing to learn how to get things done there. So when I learn something, I pass on that knowledge to other folks through the bubble wrap and it's been very popular. Good, good. The, the, uh, Jerry and Linda had our improv group on, and if you find that episode, you'll find where we talked about the the old George Carlin skit, The Seven Things You Can't Say on TV. Love it. Love it. Yeah. We talked, it started out is they saw one of our improv shows. Our next improv show is November 19th of this year. Of course, we wrote, and in that show, we talked about the seven things you can't say about the villagers TV. <laughs> And it, it was very funny. So Jerry comes backstage after the show and says, could you do that on the, on my video podcast? Yeah. And I said, sure. He comes to a meeting, and we expanded it to the 25 things <laughs> that you can't say. Well, you and I know that there's lots of stuff that people outside the bubble talk about that we know is untrue. The whole loofah sponge fiasco craziness, the whole sexually transmitted disease baloney with the first thing people tell me or ask me when I tell them I live in the villages is that kind of stuff. I'm so sick of defending it. I just give them one of these, you know, put my hand on my head. I say, really, we're going to get into that again? Yeah. It almost seems like the bad publicity more popular than the truth. The two or three films that were done about the villages, mm-hmm. only one of them is fairly uh, representative and I would call a fair Fiction of mm-hmm. life that in the village. Is called a little piece of heaven or something like that? No, uh, some kind of heaven. Some, okay. Unfortunately, I was in that film. You were? Yes. If you watch the whole thing, you'll find four seconds where I'm in it. <laughs> he came in and we recorded about 50 minutes in, in, in my living room with the lights and the camera guys and the sound guys. And he cut that all out because I told a good story. He didn't want to hear that, huh? Yeah. yeah. I used to be in the news business, and people uh, criticize us for all kinds of things. And the fact of the matter is that good news doesn't sell. When we did a newscast, we led with what we thought people would stick around for Mm -hmm. because the name of the game is eyeballs, and the name of the game is selling advertising. I am not embarrassed to tell you that. When I would write my stories, I called it a puff, giving it a little puff of air. If my story was boring, I wouldn't lie, but I would take what, what I thought was the juiciest part and put it way up front. I would have the anchors say something that would just get your attention. So you had to listen to it. Because I, yeah. And you need to grab them. I used to say, I used to say, grab them by the juggler, don't let go. And I was successful if I held your attention for a minute and 20, which is what I got from my stories. Mm-hmm. And. I knew two of the three people that they featured in Some Kind of Heaven, and I'd say that the, gig- the gigolo was just that, and the, one of the other ladies was very sad. Her husband died after she got here, and the third story about the drug-addicted husband, well, that may have been true. It's a very small percentage of the people here in the villages. Like me selling advertising on the newscast, they need to have stuff that people are going to watch, especially if they don't live in the villages. I watched it before I moved up here. My wife and I, we looked at each other and we went, really? And then I thought, wait a minute. This is just like a little mini newscast here. They're taking the little chunks of negativity and putting it. I I, I don't say anything bad about them for doing it. They're selling donuts. (laughs) Well, Lance Oppenheim, the guy who, that was his MBA or PhD thesis Mm -hmm. at the Harvard School of Film, I believe. Mm -hmm. And he had to have something that was spicy. Yes, he does have some other true life pieces in the villages, he's got 30 seconds with the Elaine Club or the swim team. But three stories he chose to highlight were terribly uncomplimentary. Of course, the guy that's living out of his uh, van, I think that wasn't that in that one too? That's the gigolo. Yeah. yeah. As I say, they're filmmakers. They, If they did a story about how wonderful it is living here, and I do think it's wonderful living mm-hmm. here, then they wouldn't sell 
people wouldn't go to the theater. But if you go out to YouTube, there are a couple of 45-minute films on YouTube Mm -hmm. about life in the villages that that are Pretty good. Absolutely. And Lent and Jerry do a pretty good job of showing right. the positive side. They do. And uh, they always disclaim on their uh, podcast or their your YouTube channel, look, they're not experts. They're just a couple of schmoes that moved here a few years ago, and they're talking about their life here. Yeah. And that's a wonderful life. One of the things that moved me to move here was the number of clubs. Yeah. Every place we looked for retirement communities, they had, oh, we had 50 clubs or 100 clubs or 150 clubs. Try 3,500. Yeah. At the time for us, it was 2,200. Mm-hmm. We said, 22. That's great. If I don't play any golf, then I have 2,195 clubs to choose from. Yep. I tell people all the time, if you can't find something here in the villages to keep you interested, then you are you don't have a heartbeat because there's really something for everyone. If you want to play bridge, if you want to play canasta, if you want to play pickleball, we have a hundred and, no, yeah, 153 pickleball courts, I think it is. Maybe no, more than that. No, no. It's probably over 200. Yeah, I think it is. So you can do anything in your heart's desire. I'm a member of the Villages Tesla Club. I'm active in that. We go out and we talk to people at the squares about the cars. We go out and have lunches together. And lately, I've been going around to people's houses that have new cars, new Teslas. And there, I grant you, it's a complicated thing. There's a learning curve there. And I help them get over that. I had a lady last week, I'll tell you, Mike. She said, will you come to my house? I really like my Tesla, but I can't really rave about it because I don't know how to use it. So I sat in her garage for an hour and a half going over every little thing that she could do. Yeah, yeah. We have the same kind of problem with the newest Mercedes. Mm -hmm. And there's a lady who's in our improv club who says, Mike, I don't want the AM radio or the FM radio to come on every time I start the car. I want to drive in silence. And so she said, I asked the sales guy how do i make it be be a silent and he said you can't turn off the radio we have the same situation with tesla the fix is turn the volume all the way down and then it will come on when you get in the car yeah that's one fix the other fix is to have nothing plugged into your usb media port and set your media center to start on the usb port there you go And and if you want fm then you have to change it to fm the truth of the matter is, with Teslas, and I'm guess I, I'm not a Mercedes uh, guy, but these are computers that happen to be cars. Tesla is essentially a computer company because they did all all the back end of how the car works is all done in house, even the stereo system. So you need to. I think a good Tesla owner does a little bit of research before they pull it into their garage, so that you're not just completely dumbfounded. And if Tesla is defined as a computer on wheels. I would say the Mercedes is designed the other way. It's a car that has computers. Mm-hmm. I think that's right because Mercedes has a long history. I'm going to as here to guess probably 120 years of history. Mm-hmm. They were famous for making safe cars, the first cars, yes. Yeah. And so Tesla's only they're mass produ- they started mass producing a car in 2020 2012 mm-hmm. with the Roadster very limited and then the Model S was their first and they their deal was we were going to have a very expensive car which it was that will help us design and manufacture the least less expensive cars. So then they came out with the 3 and the Y, and there we are. Yeah. yeah. And Mercedes is bringing out newer cars, newer electrics in less expensive versions, which is, I think, a very healthy thing to do. I think so, too. That's Tesla's plan, too. For many years, Elon Musk used to say, we're going to have a sub-$25,000 electric car. It's been in the works for a long time. The problem has been in the past that building the battery is really expensive, the lithium ion battery, but they're now doing lithium phosphate. And so that's going to help bring down that cost. And the next, I just read this yesterday, the next Tesla model is not going to be built on an assembly line as we know today. It's going to be built in separate parts of the main plant. So they'll do the body, yada, yada, yada. And then when it's all ready to go, they'll just meld it all together and out the door it goes. Fascinating. Mm, Swedish system. I don't know. Is that what they do in Volvo, with Uh, Volvo? I think they build in modules, and there's a team that builds Mm -hmm. the module. Yeah. And then someplace along the the modules are all. The other thing Tesla does, they're doing a thing called gigacasting. So they have a press that's huge. It's, you know, like a three-story building. And they can build an entire segment of the car with casting. They have uh, molds, and then they can pour the liquid in, and it does a whole back end all at once. So there's less welds less people that have to sit and put together and assemble all these things. Yeah, I hope it works. You know, because you, there, there are places where you have to assemble the parts. And I've watched the machines that Mercedes uses to put in the assembled dashboard mm-hmm. and control panels. 
and it's a really wild machine. It just goes right inside the car, okay, puts it into place, and screws it down. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Now, I've been to the Tesla factory out in Fremont, and I was like a kid in a candy store. At one part, part of the tour, we were delayed. We were riding on a little electric train, electric, obviously, and uh, we got delayed. He says, we have to wait for them to move some boxes. And I said to my passengers next to me, I said, we can sit here all day. <laughs> they were building a Model X right in front of us, and there's these guys that are on these seats that are about four inches off the ground, getting underneath and doing the wiring harnesses and stuff. I love that stuff. Remember, our next episode will be released next Friday at 9 a.m. Should you want to become a major supporter of the show or have questions, please contact us at mike at rothvoice.com. This is a shout out for supporters, Tweet Coleman, Ed Williams, and major supporter Dr. Craig Curtis at K2 in the Villages. We will be hearing more from Dr. Curtis with short Alzheimer's tips each week. If you know someone who should be on the show, contact us at mike at rothvoice.com. We thank everyone for listening to the show. The content of the show is copyrighted by Roth Voice 2024, all rights reserved.